Well, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this morning. Thank you for bringing us together again. We'll lift up Pastor Eric to you, Lord, and his whole situation in Kenya. We thank you that he's a man of God. And that he's leading people to you, <coughs> excuse me, witnessing your holy word under your holy name. And I thank you for it. We ask that you bless us all. Be with little David. Uh, it's amazing how happy he is when he's not sick, obviously, because of what's going on. You already know it. You knew it when you gave him as a gift to them. And whatever the test is, or for whomever it is, Lord, let it be successful according to your word. And let everybody learn from it and everybody be blessed by it even more. Pray this for everyone when it has uh, issues and so forth and so on. So forgive us our sins, Lord. Help us to understand this whole uh, title today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So my lovers deceived me. I took this title from the book of Lamentations, uh, chapter 1, verse 19, which was authored by Jeremiah, <coughs> who's known as the weeping prophet because of Israel's godlessness over and over and over again. And of course, having lovers refers to having illicit bed partners with whom one fornicates. That's always the theme. The whole Bible is full of it. It always, it always relates... Uh, uh, cheating on God, if you were, to this kind of uh, sexual thing with humanity, because that's exactly what it is. Because there's supposed to be a relationship between he and us. A relationship so tight that we're going to be married to Christ Jesus, the churches, that is. Okay? And so that whole concept, those whole uh, expressions of language all fit together for relationship, bottom line. Tight, unbroken relationship. <clears throat> so this other relationship, this, uh, this business here of having illicit lovers oftentimes leads to one or more of the participants to foolishly relinquishing very special and strategic information. This can be viewed as someone who willingly loads a gun with which they'll be shot sooner or later. This is what people do. We've fallen into it ourselves in our own way, especially as we were growing up and all the rest of that. There's no denying it. People do this because they're fools. I used to be a fool. I mean, I really used to be a fool. Some many people still think I am. But I ain't no fool no more. But I used to be a fool before I knew the Lord. So instead of trusting the Lord fully and completely, they throw that power away to completely untrustworthy individuals for a little perceived pleasure. Recognition or certain promises or help should it be needed. This is why people jump in a sack with other people. This is why nations jump in a sack with other nations. And this is really what we're talking about. That's what this is all about from the book of Lamentations. It's actually both. It's infidelity towards the Lord God by jumping into the sack with other nations. We're talking Israel as a whole here. Okay, the leadership, the priests and the prophets and all the rest of it. So when it does come to nations, <clears throat> those uh, and, and their leaders, when they trust uh, for some other country as a whole, this becomes very important when you take, when you give, I'm responsible, I'm the president, I'm the king, what have you, and I'm responsible for all my citizens. And if I trust another leader from another country and put you all in the breach, as it were, that's not a good thing, especially without God. God's the only one that can be trusted, period. We live in a fallen world, don't we? So that's what this is really all about. National alliances are generally a good thing, however, because there's trade and there's working together. But Israel belongs to God in a very special way, and he promised them protection and blessings to the Lord. No, no doubt about it, it's all over Scripture, isn't it? <clears throat> he said so, he chose Israel because of a man called Abram, and here's the thing that many people don't understand. Abram would believe him, and he would teach his kids, the Bible tells us, so he would believe him and so put his trust fully in the Lord. 
and in turn have that trust accounted to him as being righteous with God. This is the problem in the world. The world is completely not righteous with God. The majority of people in the world are not righteous. The majority of churchgoers are not righteous. So as it turned out, that trust is also the reason why God chose Abram, changed his name to Abraham, father of many nations, is the meaning thereof, and because through his seed would come the Savior of all mankind, who would also choose to adopt this kind of uncompromising trust in God's word. Nations shall come to me through you, Abram, God says. Therefore you shall be called Abraham from now on. Hallelujah. What, a, what an honor that is. And far from being a religious thing, this Abraham-like faith is alive, is performed daily, is magnified in letting the love of God reign supreme in this daily living and comes only by hearing and hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You can't get faith, this Abrahamic faith, any other way. That's why it started with Abraham. He didn't have the word of God except what God spoke to him and that was the word he had. And he said, I believe you. Think of that. Today we have the Bible, which is the word of God, undisputed in reality. We have people coming against it, but it's not disputable. It's the word of God, period. The 66 books I'm speaking of. So it is this faith and only this faith that counts and has merit in order to be able to stand before the Almighty and not be ashamed or condemned. That's what it takes, doesn't it? And as I've noted many times before, Scripture is crystal clear in that only those with the faith of Abraham are counted as children of Abraham by God. Galatians 3.7 and Romans 2.20 and 29 back that up. So therefore, only those with that faith can be children of God, John 1, 12. Those who come to believe in his name. Having Abraham's DNA is of no special value to God. It's like saying, I have Adam's DNA. Yeah, you do, so what? <laughs> that doesn't count. Matter of fact, that's why you're in sin. <laughs> yeah. So it's not about the DNA you have, it's about the faith you have. What kind of faith do we have? What's the quality of your faith? That's what we're talking about. Without this Abraham-like faith, no one can even please God, let alone be saved from eternal death. <coughs> from one blood God made all humanity. There is but one race, the human race, Acts 17, 26. And having said all that, Israel, God's chosen people as a nation, continue to opt for the world instead of the Lord. They do it today. They've done it all the time, up and down and up and down and more down than up. And yet we have silly people that call themselves Christians that just want to include all this nonsense when the Bible is very, you know, specific about who is his child and who is not. Who he loves and who he hates. Right here. He hates those who are impenitent sinners. Oh, 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 you're teaching heresy. No, actually, I'm teaching this scripture right here and many others, by the way. So without true Abrahamic faith, Israel hoard around on their God in many ways and continues that self-destructive practice today. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he lamented over the faithlessness of those whom God chose to be special, Abraham's physical offspring. It should have been a clue that this faith is what pleased the Lord when Moses' words are read, where God told him that, quote, In you, Abram, now Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12, 3. Obviously, this includes all the nations not physically fathered by Abraham, which proves that DNA wasn't and isn't a crucial point. What is absolutely crucial is the faith of Abraham cannot be overstated. 
which many of us Gentiles would and have adopted. Therefore, he's the father of faith for all of us. There's nothing to do with Israel, nothing to do with Islam, nothing to do with any of that nonsense or any other ism. It's just that simple. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And all who have that kind of believing in God faith are also righteous. Hallelujah. It's that simple. That's Christianity in a nutshell. And look what the world has done by the leading of Satan. Turn it into a, a bunch of nonsense, religiosity. I can't hardly take it. So most Jews today can trace the lineage to Abraham, especially the ones who cling to the unscriptural writings contained in the Talmud, believe themselves to be super special because of that. And this most arrogant and straight up demonic delusion will come back to bite them in the rear end when it's time to meet Hashem. Mm. Back in Jeremiah's day, they chose statues and images and even food items such as the cakes they baked <laughs> to the Queen of Heaven, Jeremiah 44. They blatantly ascribed life's blessing to that idol without batting an eye. The prophet says, quit doing that. The women said, no, we're not going to quit doing that. Our husbands know about it. They're okay with that. Queen of Heaven gave us all these blessings, you know, crops and bread and peace and all of this. So politically, they made trade deals and worse, military alliances for protection with the neighboring nations. And in all that, they forgot God. And whenever a prophet was sent to God, they, of course, ridiculed him, spurned him, and just basically killed him to finally shut him up. There were other voices that they listened to, like there always is, but all those voices were lies. Told them, oh, everything's fine, don't worry about Jeremiah, he's a liar, he doesn't speak for God, we speak for God. Nebuchadnezzar was smarter than that. The Gentile was smarter than that. He said, you know, you got to tell me this, tell me what it means and tell me the dream too. They said, we can't do that, we got to have the dream. He said, no, 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 you tell me the dream and then tell me the meaning. Joseph did. Told them both because God told them what the deal was. Hallelujah. I love it. And Nebuchadnezzar knew that young man has the true God. Woo. So the people accept these lavish voices that say, oh, everything's wonderful. Oh, aren't you? Oh, king, you're so wonderful. Oh, oh. Look at your entourage, look at your wealth, look at your power. Oh, you're, you're looked up to by all the other kings. Oh, king, oh, blah, 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 blah. And Jeremiah says, nah, that ain't nothing. You're going down, the country's going down. You're all going to go into captivity, and you're not going to go there for just a few weeks. It's going to be years and years and years and years and years and years and years. They're like, that can't be. It's the 6th century B.C. and Israel has been steadily going downhill as a nation in terms of forgetting the Lord. This was, you know, up and down. God's blessing of plenty and peace among neighboring lands up to that point in time was enjoyed, but the credit went everywhere but to the Lord. It's the Queen of Heaven. It's this statue. It's this other guy over here. This is what they did. They left the Lord. What would you do if you were God? So because of unbelief, they attributed these blessings to pagan deities. Not that they had no faith, they just gifted it to idols. Because faith is always involved, there's no such thing. It's just like there's no such thing as an atheist, that's too idiotic. An atheist is someone who just believes himself to be God, or something else. It's always about believing the wrong report while simultaneously trashing the report of the Lord. And when we read in Scripture that they were in unbelief, it simply means that they didn't believe God, the Lord's own words. But they did believe the false prophet's reports. So they still had faith. It's not like they were faithless like that. They were faithless towards the true God. They were so ate up with pride and self-assurance that they thought themselves to be invincible as a nation. 
And it's the same attitude promoted by many, if not all, Talmudic Jews today. And they are not much different than purely secular Jews like Bibi Netanyahu himself. It's a shame because the very same mindset that Jeremiah and all the prophets dealt with continues to this day. And today, Christianity, true Christians are the modern prophets. And they point to the New Testament. And they point to Yeshua, who proved himself, you know, a million different ways. But you wouldn't accept it. Paul said that Satan has put a veil over their eyes in 2 Corinthians 2, or 3, 14. Only Christ can remove that veil. When you come to faith in Christ, that veil is gone. It was for me, and I'm not even Jewish, but I had a veil. I didn't recognize the world. I was part of it. And then when I got saved, I realized, whoa, I'm no longer that, and I don't want to be that. That's over there. Is that the way it is? Yeah, you get to know the difference. Praise His name. See, the very same faith that made Abraham righteous before God is what they, uh, along with all unbelievers, lack today. I mean, it's lacking, sadly, all over Israel. All humanity, Jews and Gentiles alike, are in the very same boat living on this cursed earth. This earth is cursed. If there's any climate change, it's not because we eat meat. <laughs> it's because the earth is cursed by God because of unbelievers. And though they invoke his name and pretend to seek him, they really don't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. Rather, they choose to be stuck in the mire of dead religiosity, this is what it is. It's always about it. some friggin' religion. I can't take it. In Israel, in Jerusalem, the holiest place for the three monotheistic religions. I just, I'm sick of hearing that nonsense. There are no three religions. There are millions of them. <laughs> but none of them count except the faith of Abraham in the God of the Bible. That's it. Nothing else. Religious Jews, Orthodox, or whatever, are not any better off than secular Jews. They also don't know God, and worse, He doesn't know them. Galatians 4, 9. Paul says, good that you know God, rather than He knows you. Wow. 1 Corinthians 8, 3 says, but if anyone loves God, this one that loves God is known by Him. has a relationship with him, is protected by him, is blessed by him. It can't get any better than that. God himself says this about the one that loves him. All believers are pleasing him by believing. <laughs> I can't please him by the way I look and dance and put a metal roof on. <laughs> <laughs> I can only please him by believing what he said which is contained in Holy Scripture the Bible there ain't none of other Holy Scripture and only these and these alone are loved by him Psalm 146 8 says God loves the righteous you're righteous because you've been made righteous like Abraham was made righteous how? by believing the true God there's no two ways about that one. So what's up with those who snuggle up to lovers that will only deceive, disappoint, and betray them in this life? And then towards the end, hand them that one-way ticket to hell. Well, in fact, that Jerusalem could be sieged and overtaken, as was prophesied, much less destroyed, was the farthest thing from anyone's mind that Jeremiah and the rest talked to. Oh no, it can't happen here. What do the Jews say today? No more, referring to the Holocaust, no more. And now they're doing the Holocaust. I mean, it's crazy. It's Satan. Satan. 
and we're arming him to do that. It's American bombs and American planes that are doing this. Hmm. See, even some of Israel's enemies at the time believed the same lie because the Lord had taken care of Israel. It just wasn't normal that Israel wasn't taken care of for some of those generations. And that only aids the ones who already have that mindset. Israel's leaders, religious and political, had for some time ditched the Lord God and engaged in trusting the horses and chariots of their allied neighbors to come and protect them. David authored Psalm 20, and in verse 8 he says so, now David, somebody, a mighty man of battle, he understood what a chariot on the battlefield can do and will do, and the power of the horse on the battlefield. And yet God said, don't be trusting in horses, don't be trusting in a strong man, don't be trusting in armies, other kings, anybody else, don't be doing this number, because they can't help you, it's only me. I'm the only one who can help you. So as is recorded in the book of Jeremiah and the book of the Lamentations, ditching the Lord is never a good idea. It is always horrible and disastrous. Now back in the day, it was about Israel, the physical nation, and its salvation on earth, since it represented the people of God on a collective, in a collective way. And the cross of Christ had not yet physically come at that time. But since the cross is no longer about nation saving, it's about individual souls getting born again by the Spirit of the living God, who is the same Lord to whom Abraham gave all his trust. It's about eternity and avoiding a lake of fire, not just the desire to be safe and to not have your crop fail. So with the Lord's blessing, milk and honey will flow in abundance in the physical as well as in the spiritual. Even today, I feel like we're blessed. I mean, let's face it, when you look at what's going on in the world and how some people live, are you not blessed? Yeah. See, both time frames concerned themselves with full-on trust in the Lord back then as well as now. As Abraham's full-on trust was accounted to him for righteousness, so is everyone's trust in the Lord equally accounted. You are righteous in God's name <coughs> because you believe in the Lord and His Word. Nothing different from Abraham. There's no other way to please God, Romans 8, 8 says so. And Hebrews 6, 11 says it's impossible without faith to please Him. Having the Lord's stamp of approval that is being declared righteous by Him is proof of pleasing Him. Do I please God 24-7? I doubt it. Do I please Him when I'm going down the road and <laughs> those scenarios come to me and I fly off at the mouth? I don't even know they're coming. They're just there. I thank God for Romans chapter 7. But I please Him because I believe Him. And His mercy covers everything else. How many times did David write, Have mercy on me, Lord. No. Judge me by Your mercy and Your loving kindness. Don't judge me by what I did. Judge me by Your mercy and loving kindness. And Your justice is all wrapped the same. Wow. We've talked about this many times, but it bears saying again, this peace on earth business, goodwill toward men, is only with whom he is well pleased, who have this faith of Abraham, the one on whom his favor rests, that will be his gift of grace, hallelujah, isn't that awesome? The one he intimately, relationally knows, the ones who love him, the ones who are careful not to do an Ephesus thing, and get too busy with life, even the work of the ministry, being self-deceived by those who, uh, whose bent humanity jumps in is most common. The blame is hardly ever assigned to the self, though. It's always somebody else that's at fault. 
And even in this we deceive ourselves further because we feel that shoving this blame away from us somehow makes the deception more tolerable. I feel so stupid that I did this, but it's got to be them, it's their fault. So I'm not quite as stupid anymore in my own mind. Total self-deception. It's unbelievable how we deceive ourselves. Even as believers, this is why it's a fight. This is why we got to buffet ourselves, which I'll get into in a little bit. Sometime this afternoon. <laughs> but it is self-deception. It's like chasing our own tails, like slapping ourselves, applying circular reasoning. In truth, I, me, and myself caused this through an unvetted desire and insatiable appetite to satisfy the flesh. That's the bottom line. If I give in to that one, God's going to set me free from it. And if I'm not strong, I'm going to continue doing it. But in His mercy, He'll keep setting me free. The moment I say, oh God, I don't know if you're really here or not, I must have made a mistake, I won't be set free. I'm going to stay with the Lord. Like Paul, I am keeping the faith. Hallelujah. See, I wager that a very few Christians see this as a fight. Instead of confronting it in a relentless battle, they spend a lifetime just wallowing in the religiosity of it. Oh, I'm religious. I go to church. I cross myself. I light a candle. You know, blah, blah, blah. All that's trash compared to the faith of Abraham. If you don't have the faith of Abraham, all this stuff does you no good. Doesn't do any good anyway, but you got to have the faith of Abraham. <laughs> that at least covers it all. Care must be taken by all of us believers not to fall and end up as those described in 2 Peter 2.22. They were set free, and then they go back to the mire. In his letter to the Romans, Paul said it was a fight. What or who are we fighting? Many don't even know this. Many people are like oblivious to what we're fighting. Because they don't believe in demons. You know, they think it's cast by the ghost, ghostbusters and all that. No, it's real. Demons are real. They're sitting on your shoulder every day. They decide things for you who are wishy-washy and you think it's you. Happens all the time. Paul said it's a fight. And what are we fighting? Who are we fighting? Now it seems rather clear more and more that we're fighting on at least two fronts. It's always been like that, but it becomes more clear as we get older and as time proceeds. Paul wrote to Timothy at the end of his life that he had fought a good fight. And a good fight is the one you win. 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have kept the faith. Oh, I love that. I just, just like, no ifs and buts or screwing around with that one. I have kept the faith, Timothy. Now you keep yours and tell everybody else to keep theirs. Mm -hmm. So on one side, we have obvious fallen angels, demons, and devils to contend with from the spiritual realm. But also we face off with our own flesh through which this ever-present evil is with us. It continually dwells and fights against the reborn spirit mentally inside. That's what this is all about. Romans 7, 15 through 23. You see, we can't very well knock out the spirits attacking us like some physical criminal standing in front of us. That'd be easy. That'd be great. I'd love to. But it won't help me in my fight in the spirit. So we have to strike our own flesh, which is a weapon with which the demonic evil attacks come. Our very own flesh became a weapon used against us. It is through the flesh that evil desires are channeled. To combat this, Paul said that he toughens himself up. He buffets his body. He fights, not like someone beating the air or shadow boxing, but seriously. Now the Greek term is kolafizo, 
and it literally means to hit, punch, beat, etc. To be clear, Paul did not physically beat himself. Luther tried that, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. A lot of religions do the self-flagellation business, it doesn't work. Sin is still sin. You can beat yourself to shreds, you can beat your head against the wall till you have no head. It doesn't matter, you'll still be a sinner. This is language to explain a spiritual concept. The language surveys, or rather serves, to convey the idea of toughening up our faith. To keep standing when the standing gets tough. You know, we got that old expression. The tough, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Well, that's really a spiritual thing. Paul disciplined his body to not seek after the devil's enticements. He knew that they would come through the body. He knew that with some pretty thing waking at him at the street corner, in the marketplace in Jerusalem or someplace wherever he traveled, he wasn't going to dwell on it, he wasn't going to think on it, he wasn't going to do any possibility in his mind, he wasn't playing any games. He put that down immediately. Like scripture says, put down every thought, and that's why. So he toughens himself. He disciplined his body to not seek after the devil's enticements. The thorn from Satan to buffet or beat him uses the same Greek word, kolafizo. He received a beating spiritually from this uh, messenger of Satan that God sent because he was showing things in heaven he could have really went into one. Well, I've, I've been to heaven, you know. Mm -hmm. I've been to heaven. <sighs> I have been to heaven. Look at all the people on the internet today. Millions of them. They've all been to heaven. They've seen the internet. God showed them hell, heaven, blah, blah, blah. A bunch of trash. Every single one of them trash. They're lying. They're devils. Every one of them, whether it's a little child or a grown up person, it's garbage. I could start a tirade on that one, but I'm going to be called calm, calm, cool, and collected. So this buffet and this tempting him must have been really powerful. That's why he begged God three times for him to quit. And Paul was no wimp, was he? Mm -hmm. Look at everything he went through. So the above is in the stark contrast to self-gratification. You gotta buffet yourself. You gotta buffet. I gotta buffet myself. I can't buffet you and you can't buffet me. We got to do it on our own. Are you learning anything so far? Is the Lord speaking to somebody? I hope so. Because I'm just screaming up here. So this stark contrast to self-gratification, to want to feel good, to experience pleasures, this is where unbuffeted flesh seeks to go. Right in the sack. Right in the sack. I want to be with my lover. Are you hearing me? Yes. yes. Sexual pleasures especially is at the top of that list once we become more aware of that desire which is driven by the various human cultures of the day. They've changed over the millennia of course and differ slightly among people groups but the sex appeal remains exactly the same everywhere and with everyone. See it's this business of sex appeal is so personal that God said, I can't get in there. I want you to be personal with me. This is the problem. In fact, the term sex appeal was used to advertise, you better get some. Do your hair this way, wear your makeup this way, pump your body this way, wear these jeans, wear that shirt, smoke these cigarettes, drink this whiskey. <laughs> All that will give you sex appeal. So that somebody else will say, Woo, I want him or her or them. Or I want to be like them. I want to jump in the sack with them. Am I right? Mm -hmm. See, I, you already know everything I'm saying. But we need to be reminded, don't we? 
when I prayed about what to preach this week, a couple of weeks ago, it's like, it took me a few days to get solid what he wanted me to do. That's how all of these things are, so, yeah. It's a natural condition in humanity. It comes out strong with puberty. Satan knows this and exploits the condition. The Bible is full of warnings against fornication, against loose sexual appetites, against revealing and showing your thighs, against wearing revealing clothes, all of which should be shameful to us. But we call it fashion. The devil took care of that problem by making it cool, desirable to be part of the in crowd, the thing to go after, etc. Using, of course, Hollywood and the music industry in the main. See, my lovers also deceived me. Who or what are they? I know you all want to know. The answer, they're the same as yours. <laughs> we all got the same lovers. Your lovers also deceive you. And they're so plentiful that we could say they are a legion. See, in this life, evil is present with us. As Peter noted, the devil is continuously on the prowl. Seek him whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5.8 See, if what I'm saying it weren't true, the devil's wasting his time. And he knows he's got a little time. He don't have a lot of time. Did you ever get the thought of getting back at someone? Don't you make a judgment call about what punishment so-and-so deserves? based solely on the sparse and very fragmented information we have and much of that through the world's fake news outlets. We all do it. Yeah. See, you can bury yourself with so much work as in how you make a living that you can temporarily escape some of the attacks until they follow you in your path. Mine come when I'm alone in the streets <laughs> many times I'm driving. Uh, but they want to get your attention. They must get your attention. Satan does what Paul did. Be everything to everyone. The difference is that Paul's purpose and reason was to spread the gospel leading to salvation. Satan, on the other hand, comes only to destroy John 10.10. 10. See, when we idolize anything, that is, spend so much time and devotion to it, where it cuts into our personal time that could and should be spent with the Lord Jesus, we've invited the devil to the party. Just as he's behind every statue or some other relic, he's sure to be behind all we do with such fervor that ruins our real time with the Lord. All the warnings of preachers over the centuries. Read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. Something, read it every day, read it all the way through. Read the Bible, read the Bible. Are true. <laughs> how you read it and how much you read, totally up to you. There's no sanction on that. See, Jesus takes all this most personally as is evident by a stern warning to the Ephesians. Revelation 2, 1 through 7. He had all these compliments. They were all right. They were working for him. They were doing ministry. Dig me. But they lost their personal touch with the Lord. And that, all by itself, is the most precious to him. Apparently, uh, although he was sinned in ways too, Abraham, because he wasn't Jesus. But he had a relationship with the Lord that caused the Lord to say, yeah, we're in relationship. We're so tight, you and me. And I'm not going to keep any secrets from you. Wow. In fact, I'm going to call myself because you two, your son and grandson are going to do the same thing in their own way. I'm going to call myself forever the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of those who believe in me and my word. 
That's really what it's saying. So thoughts from the dark side come precisely to get your attention. This is also why we're commanded to put them down immediately, if not sooner. Because they all exalt themselves above the knowledge of God, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 and 6. We have to choose what we allow to take root in our lives. Did you hear me? We have to choose what we allow to take root in our lives. We get to do that. Our relationship with our Savior Jesus must remain so exciting that we can't wait for the next opportunity to be with Him. Have you ever read uh, oh, uh, the love story in the Bible? The, called the, the high poem is what it is. Uh, Solomon? Yeah, it's Solomon. It's about Solomon. It's right after it. The Song of Solomon, thank you. There's your love relationship. The young bride to be, the church, cannot wait to see the lover, her future husband. And he cannot wait to be back with her again, to be united. It's an awesome account. See, the meaning of relationship is a loving, time-spending action. That's a good short way to say what relationship really is. A loving, time-spending action. It is not a marriage contract as such. That's a different thing that should be embedded in the loving, time-spending action. But by itself, it's not what it is. It's something different. See, the doing is what counts because the doing proves the love. Faith without works is dead, James 2.17. Knowing that there is only one scripture, and knowing that <clears throat> that is the Yeshua Logos, the written Jesus, we can have a relationship with him by just reading the Bible. Mm. Read the Bible. Get by yourself, everybody else, cut out all the noise and all the stupid stuff, and get with the Bible, the word of the living God. And he will direct... Your thoughts, he will direct where you should go next, or what have you. This, by the way, is irrefutable scriptural proof of free will. This is true because of all the thoughts from the devil come in order to persuade the believer to stop believing the Lord. Isn't that why they come? That's the fight of faith. Or to keep someone from coming to faith in the first place. This is Satan's job. Think of it, these devils and demons can become our lovers. Woo! Uh, what? You're speaking heresy. Uh, no, you probably got one of those or more. That's what you think, you got at least one. <laughs> you need to get real with it. If there's no devil hassling you, where's your faith? Where's your faith? If you don't have to fight a fight, where's your faith? They want us to act on the temptation. Satan didn't get the title of Parazone or the tempter for nothing. God doesn't tempt, but he does. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken us except that which is common to man. It's not sparse. It's not once in a while. It's not, oh, I had one of those 25 years ago. It's common to every man to be tempted. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And because that's a fact, you've got to keep the faith. And that takes a fight. And the fight is with your own flesh. And you've got to buffet it. You've got to buffet it. Come on, enemy. I'm still going to believe. I'm still going to stand when it's all said and done. See, the Lord makes a way of escape. However, we have to do the escaping. We don't know where to go. Where do we go? All of a sudden, there's a sign from God. Go that way. And I say, I don't know. Uh oh, I'm going to get hit. 
going to be ugly. As opposed to the guy that says, thank you, Lord. And he's out of there. If you were a devil and you had somebody just under your thumb, you'll get your foot on him, whatever, and, and he goes for that sign, that exit sign, you can't keep a hold of him. It's like, like, like a slippery pig, you know, and a greased pig in one of those contests. You just can't grab him, right? Jesus said, the devil has nothing on me. It means he can't grab a hole. He's got no fingertip, nothing. He's got no legs. He's got nothing on me. Because I'm smooth. I'm suave. Jesus was so smooth, the devil couldn't do nothing. He could not accuse him. He could not tempt him. He could not do anything. There's nothing he could call him. Yeah, I remember when you were 14, you said to your other father, Dad, Joseph, you said something you shouldn't have said. He couldn't do that because Jesus never did that. I remember when you were nine, you and your buddies around town, around the village there, you, you stole something. You couldn't do that because Jesus never did that. He could do those things with all of us, couldn't he? The next verse, verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 10 says, Therefore, brethren, flee from idolatry. This right here, this is idolatry. Having a close personal relationship that's so tight with someone other than the Lord. See, I desire His empowerment. We have a free will. We can choose to stay on that stupid road or take the way out that He has provided. Praise His name. And most people... And David did this too, and I've done it, and I'm sure you've done it, and it may not be my last time, in fact, it probably won't be, that I don't get off. I don't take that sign, though. I don't see it, or I claim I don't see it. God's going to make sure you know about it, otherwise you can't be blamed, right? <laughs> and then i got to go to the Lord and say, have mercy on me, according to your loving kindness, like David did. And I will do that, and I have done that, and I'll continue to do so. See, current modern Israel is in bed with her lovers. Especially the Western world. But the nation Israel hasn't changed. God has allowed the people to be back in the land, but He hasn't given them the title. He hasn't handed it over. And He won't until they cry, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. And this, of course, is after Armageddon and only the remnant of Jews who survived the very soon coming Great Tribulation. Uh, this applies only to them. All, and there are many who cry for a two-state solution, are ignorant. They're ignorant of the fact that in the end it will not be a solution. It cannot be. <laughs> Rather, that can only make things worse. Also, they are ignorant of the fact that the Lord... <clears throat> the land, rather, is God's land and that not the Jews who now live in it, not the UN, not the United States. Nobody owns that land but God. That is Beulah land, the beautiful land, the land he chose to put his hill, his, his temple, himself, his presence, Zion. And people get that confused with political Zionism and the nonsense going on today, not even the same by 10 gazillion miles. A true Zion is one thing, and everything else is fake, although it's called Zion. There are some 33 verses in the Bible that inform us that God owns everything. Genesis 14, 19, Isaiah 45, 18, Job 41, 11, et al. Ah, I love it. Now these same people that want a two-state solution also pretend that the notion from the river to the sea as the Zionists describe it, and the Palestinians, by the way, so-called Palestinians, is something unreasonable, they say. It's even evil. And that it shouldn't be allowed. There must be a two-state solution. They think peace will come by splitting up the land that isn't anyone's to split up. That's their problem. In fact, the Lord warns of it in Joel 3.2. We're going to read that straight out of Scripture. Yeah. Joel 3.2. Go to Joel. Count to three, and then count to two. <laughs> Joel 
Hosea Joel. Hosea. Tell me when you're there. Man is there. <laughs> okay, you ready? Verse 1 and following. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. Sounds like, well, that already happened. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 2. I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's never happened yet. That's Armageddon. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. They're going to divide the land, folks. It's going to happen. It's already divided in many ways, but they're going to legally divide it, what they call legal, through the UN and all the rest of it. They have cast lots for my people and have given as a boy a payment for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. There it is. They've divided up my land. What do you think God's going to do with that? He said, don't do it. Somebody must be punished. God's going to use his righteousness to punish. But when someone's impenitent and, and completely faithless and godless, their punishment can't be but one thing, and that's lake of fire. They will split it up, and when they do, Armageddon comes. It may be one of the signs. When we see on the news or something... You know, they just signed a deal, something like that. Uh, it could tie in with a peace deal that Israel will sign. And I, it makes more sense to me now. And this is not even in my notes. I just feel like i got to say it. I'm almost done anyway. I can see my amen down here, so don't worry. <laughs> but I can... Uh, <clears throat> all this nonsense going on right now, this will escalate to a point to where somebody might say, you know what, we have to stop this. And then they'll all get together, they'll sign a deal. We're out of here, and then everything will fall down and break loose. That's a possibility. I now see I didn't never saw it like that before because we never had the situation like it is today. See, we're learning every day and every week as things change how the, the, uh, what we think we understand about prophecy in the last days will be directed. See, they don't get the fact, these guys that want to split it up, they don't get the fact there's a difference between fake Jews and the true ones to whom this land will be given by Almighty God Himself after the tribulation. Because the prophecy is that at one day they'll never be destroyed, they'll never be overtaken again. They will all come to Him. He'll be their God, they'll be His people. That's not happening now. It hasn't happened in the past. It will only happen in the near future. And that's it then. From then on, no more running over Jerusalem. Although Satan will try at the end of the millennium, he won't be able to do it. He's a liar and a loser. So what exactly will God hand over to the remnant? He told Abraham. It's recorded in Genesis 13, 14, and 15, and 18, and Exodus 23, 31. That's, those are the dimensions he'll hand over. And from there... They'll run, run the whole world. And this is why I, I believe with uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, uh, I've come to believe it, uh, that King David will be raised up. It's pretty clear in Scripture. He will rule Jerusalem, and Jesus will travel the world ruling things with the nations because he's king of kings. Hallelujah. It's awesome. That makes total sense to me. Yes, Israel's lovers will betray but as we can see today with what's going on in Gaza and beyond, Israel is complicit in that whole affair because what goes around comes around. It's just that simple. They're not innocent. They're complicit. Joel Osteen's audience is not innocent. They want to hear the trash he speaks. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. And all the other false ones out there. And there's a bunch So no wonder they will all willingly sign a deal with Antichrist, the final Antichrist. They'll think that he's a great lover with whom to jump into the sack. 
That's what Israel will think. So to all who already believe, keep the faith. And to all who still don't believe, come to faith in Christ. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for everything's coming to pass exactly as you say. And we only get to recognize it as it happens. But I ask for insight, Lord, for any and all true believer, so that we, just like one of the Proverbs says, that we don't you know, keep our head in the sky. We look forward to see the danger so we can go around it, under it, over it. Forewarn us, Lord, for that which we still have to deal with on earth before you remove the church in its entirety. And still we pray, Lord, remove us from here ASAP. Let the fullness of the Gentiles be today even, in Jesus' name. Forgive us our sins. Amen. Amen. Amen.